So if these guys are doing the task and changing the regime, this is at least one step for him to, uh, from the battle that he's supposed to wage it. So that's why that is his tactically probably mm. broadcasting that message, mm -hmm. but doesn't necessarily he's embracing the democracy and the freedom and the rule Definitely of law. Definitely not. Definitely not. And we are here in the International Herald Tribune. Deadly blasts in Kirkuk hit Iraqi security forces. Again, unrest in Iraq and in Kirkuk specifically. Three explosions aimed at Iraqi security forces ripped through the divided northern city of Kirkuk on Thursday morning, killing at least 28 people and wounding scores more. The attackers uh, used uh, a no-familiar tactic, uh, detonating a small impoverished explosive device attached to a sedan in a parking lot outside the local police headquarters. After police rushed to the scene, a large car bomb went off, killing 17 officers and 11 civilians. The same tactic, the same uh, suicide bombings, the same uh, attacks the same detonation of devices put uh, under cars. Now, what is new in Iraq? How can we say that the Iraqi security forces are ready to take uh, the security responsibility now and this year exactly when the U.S. are withdrawing the troops? You know, for the Iraq, there is a, you, you, can't, you can't provide security. The security will come once there is a political solution. Mm and they need to go and address mm. the political solutions. Because it seems to be that is, there is an element that are controlling the power, controlling the wealth, and they left out a lot of majority that they are feeling that they left out. So there is, you know, they got to accommodate the opposition, they got to address the, you know, the grievances, and then that will bring the peace and security, mm. rather than, you know, training the police forces and etc. So let me ask uh, this question that could be a theory many could think about and do you think that those kind of bombs and uh, attacks could be made by Americans themselves? You know, I don't see the, uh, you know, this is a part of the conspiracy theory type of argument. The Americans, they really, especially Obama administration, they want, they want to withdraw from Iran. Do they? Because he made that pledge on the elections. And he cannot go to the American people and saying, you know, here I still were in Iraq. So he need to say that I, I made, I, I met my pledges. I made my commitment to the American voters. That is, I withdraw or reduce the forces in Iraq. So, so I, it is possible that the Iraqis will do it to keep the Americans not to leave, because there is some element that they really want to see. That would be another theory mm -hmm. anyway. Inter also another uh, um, item from the International Herald Tribune article here, Cold War terrorist calls Osama bin Laden a martyr. Uh, the notorious Cold War terrorist Carlos the Jekyll is hailing Osama bin Laden as a martyr, saying he earned himself a place in the history through his terrorism uh, deeds. What do you think about these statements that are not taken only by uh, this terrorist, but also by some others? Because uh, both of them are belonging to one school of thoughts, and that's a school of, of, of violence and using of force. Mm. So it, you know, nobody should be surprised that Carlos will come out and embracing mm. those, that vision, because they are all using the similar tactics. So uh, it's the same school. Is the, world is, uh, uh, is the world in need for uh, uh, violence in the meantime? Violence is the is is weapons of all days. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a viable thing. Nobody will going to condone a violence. And I think now we are moving to the era that is, we want to get rid of the dictators, we want to get rid of, we want to see the government accountable, we want to see the democracy, we want to see the debate, the exchange of ideas, and, and that's the challenge that we need to face it rather than using bullets and, and bombs to settle the differences. Mm, definitely. The spread of peace culture is something very difficult those days. From the Independent and Dominique Strauss-Kahn quits the IMF over charges. Dominique Strauss-Kahn, who has been widely praised for his leadership of the International Monetary Fund and its involvement in solving Europe's woes, resigned today to devote all his energy to fighting sexual assault charges in New York. 
What's your comment to that? You know, that's a very, it's a very sad story. Exactly. And, and uh, somebody on that statue being called into this uh, kind of an act, it will, it is a very debilitating experience for everybody and his mm -hmm. family. So it seemed to be very tough and uh, he's paying a price. It's, uh, it's actually a very sad story that such a man, because he was an excellent figure, especially in economics, Plus, he's running for president. And his career in this way. Anyway, we're, we're going here to our main topic and Egypt. 100 days after the uh, 25th of January revolution, Egypt uprising reporter, two Egypts, two Egypts have emerged. In the past 100 days, two Egypts have emerged. One is revolutionary Egypt driven by uh, ideals and demanding reforms and institutional change. And then there is the other Egypt in which the military tries to maintain law and order. In certain areas, those two Egypts conflict. In other areas, they converge. Right now, they are torn apart and heading in very different directions. How true is this? You know, I, I, you know Egypt which, uh, has a very, very, you know, bright future and it is true that is the society is coming from the you know shadow of the of the of the of the, of the system that was denying basic rights and etc now people start reconstituting those rights and it is very natural that we'll see people try to express those mm -hmm. it is true that there is you know the values that people express their votes their, their ideas is very limited they could come to the, you know, to the radio station and the TV station and make those demonstrations. But I think the country is, is heading on the right direction. Probably, we just need to have a less of demonstration because the economy is suffering from it. That's the one that, that little bit worried lots of people because the, the hard currency in Egypt is going down very faster. And today, the Americans and the IMF they are willing to give Egypt about $2 billion more. The reserve is going very fast. And every time that there is a demonstration in Actually, the U.S. will give Egypt $1 billion and will take off Egypt's uh, debts, one, uh, another uh, other $1 billion. So it's almost, almost uh, if you add it up, you are, uh, you are you know, better off for the sh in the short run. You are better off having a little bit of money to keep that reserve from running it down. Well, let's hope so because we are dealing with a very heavy challenge here in the economy. Egypt's uprising bring DIY spirit out on the streets. In the 100 days since Hosni Mubarak was toppled, there has been an explosion of creative energy in the alternative arts. It is on the 28th of January, the bloodiest day of Egypt's uprising, that Islam Rifaat was run over by a security truck near the Interior Ministry. The collision fractured his skull and the Etidian all died shortly afterwards. So, this is a very sad story here. Also, another uh, article, Egypt's man from the past who insists he has a future, Zahi Hawes, appointed by Hosni Mubarak to oversee Egypt's cultural riches, is the great survivor of the revolution. Zahi Hawes, the 63-year-old headed Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities from 2002, Onwards, like so many other Mubarak era public figures, he is struggling to curve out a role in post uprising Egypt. How far do you see the role played by Zeha West in protecting the Egyptian antiquities? I think the antiquities were protected during the revolution. That was a very good, you know, uh, good management style. It's showing that was, you know, nothing had been stolen, nothing being damaged. Actually, uh, there were. 1,250 were not retrieved yet, pieces. Okay. So, so at least, you know, the, in other countries, you know, like Iraq, in the, during the revolution things, people have stolen everything, so there's nothing left. So for Egypt, that's a treasure that they need to keep it very dearly, and it shouldn't be politicized. It's supposed to be just, you know, this is a, this is a treasure of the country. Egypt is about, about the history, it's the mother of nations, so they need to keep those things. Right. To our uh, questions here, the new Egypt 100 days on a series published in The Guardian, 100 days after the fail of Hosni Mubarak, Egypt's prospects are clouded by insecurity, economic worries 
and sectarian violence with all the daily developments in the Middle East. Egypt remains the focus of the international press as illustrated by such serious. What's your comment? You know, the, you know what is suffering is the economy. The tourism is suffering a great deal. Uh, people are interested to visit Egypt. But every time that I see demonstration in Tahrir Square, I'll be hesitant to come. Every time that I see that there is no police in the street, but it increases my fears to visit the country. So what it needs is people need to give a sense of assurance that Egypt is back to the normal life. I think the, we need to have see less of the demonstration. We need to see that the press writing a lot about the issues and give you know, opportunities that people discuss ideas to, to find a way that people express those grievances through the media, through, the, through writings, rather than every time people coming and you know, meet in, in a Tahrir Square. Because now the political parties need to start talking about their programs, mm -hmm. what, how they're going to run the country, what is their plan for the future of the country. Presidential candidates, they need to come out with their plans. That's what people need to focus on, rather than focusing about the old days, you know, this soap opera that is going on. So it's better focusing on the future rather than the past. Dr. Hamid, two main things are hitting Egypt in the meantime. The insecurity in the streets, of course, that is beside the economy, but those are two other main things. Uh, insecurity, which creates instability, and that uh, pricing of the sectarian sedition. I'm not, I don't want to say the word sectarian uh, strife. So what do you think about those two challenges and how can we deal with them? You know, uh, with the freedom, there is a the responsibility attached to it always. In other words, my expression, my views it will stop when I'm encroaching in somebody else's freedom. So, so the rule of law is supposed to be enforced. You know, mm. everybody that transgresses boundaries is supposed to be stopped by the law. And there is this minor thing that is happening left and right. This is supposed to be also stopped. And the, the, the law is supposed to be very strict on those who transgress on the other's rights. This country is, is Egyptian, it's called Egyptian. There is no sectarian tensions. There is a small element that is happening. This could happen at any society, but sometimes it will come out of, out of proportion. Government need to step in and stop it before it become escalated. This is, a, this is the important thing that they need to pay attention to it so that we don't see this happening you know, in this remote areas. And, and, and the other thing also, uh, people need to have a dialogue and discussions mm -hmm. on the issue that is they don't likely to discuss in public. So they need to talk about this, about the relation between mm -hmm. the different community and how they can manage the relation, how they can handle the differences, w you know, how they're going to handle if somebody is moving from one sect to another sect. Is that a problem? If somebody moving from one religion to another religion, is that a problem? This is a part of the individual rights. This is a part of the freedom. That's a part of the democracy. So we must move to the direction that is, people have the rights to embrace whatever they believe on it. Nobody shall enforce them to do something different. Mm. And the violence should not be, it's not a time for violence. This is a time for ideas, time for discussion, time for uh, embracing each other rather than, and benefit from what happened on the revolution. The revolution has shown that Egyptian society come together as one family and, 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 and they made a change. Mm. Big changes are ahead of them, and those were not going to be achieved without the unity. And the strength of Egypt will come from the, through the unity rather than this little politics that some elements are trying to inject in the society. I guess what we need here is a real dialogue that would reach out to people, normal people, common people in the streets. Yes, I do. So as to calm down the situation, we'll go through the Obama speech in two minutes because this is all what I have. The International Herald Tribune says Obama's Middle East speech has many American audiences. And from The Guardian, Assad must reform or get out of the way, says Obama. And from The Independent, Obama salutes Middle East longing for freedom. Now, the Guardian reported that Obama reached his conclusion with a note to his domestic audience, the voters back home, by drawing a comparison between the events in the Middle East and the past political struggles in the U.S. Does this appear? So, you know, uh, Obama is, is, is ahead of his team in reading what is happening in the Middle East. 